Every year that I've been here, we've always had a New Year's resolution sermon the first Sunday of January. Fortunately, we couldn't do that this this year. With uh, I was I was laid up for a couple of weeks there, but as we discussed last week, we made a reference to the fact that we can never expect to grow if the only times that we look at the Bible, that we, that we pick it up and read the words in it, if we only do that on Sunday and Wednesday, we're never going to grow. This morning I want to discuss the importance of growing in God's Word and doing so with a heart and a mind that seeks to learn. A lot of times at the new year, people are starting Bible readings through the year. And so people have kind of a, there's different charts that are available. Read through the Old Testament in a year, read through the New Testament in a year. Sometimes it's going back and forth between Old and New Testament. Reading, it's, it's great. Okay, reading it is good. But it's important that we absorb what we read. There's a difference between reading it and studying it. And read through the Bible in a year. Go through that track. That's great. But also take a little bit of time when you do that, if you in, in, have a mind to do that this year. But take some time to actually study some as well. Make sure that you're absorbing what it is that you're reading because we can check all the boxes. We can say, I've read through the Bible in my lifetime ten times. And it doesn't mean anything if I don't understand what it is I've read. Or if I've read through it just to be able to say, I've read through the Bible. It's important that we give ourselves to improving our knowledge in God's Word. This is true all the time. Not just for the New Year's resolutions. It's not just for 2022. But if we seek to serve God and if we seek to be pleasing to Him, we have to continue to grow in knowledge. Even the oldest of us, I'm looking at Keith, even the oldest of us will always be able to say there's more that we can learn. There's more that we can study. And then even the stuff that we have learned, a lot of times, if it's not kept fresh in our minds, we forget it. As Elizabeth and I have learned with our kids' homework, some of these questions that they bring home, I'm like, I, never, I, I know I never had these questions when I was in school. I don't understand the purpose. I don't understand the point. But I do know some of my mathematics, some of my multiplication, but then they go, we have to show our work in long division. I don't know how to do that. I get out my calculator because I've forgotten how to do long division. Sometimes that knowledge, that information, if it's not kept up, we forget it. We lose track of it. And so reminding ourselves in God's word, whether it's something we've never studied before or going over something maybe we've studied a hundred times before is crucial for us to continue to improve our knowledge. Because what's going to happen is that as you gain more wisdom, as you gain more life experience, and that's true for the oldest of us and the youngest of us, more and more application is going to come from God's Word. More and more opportunity to apply it is going to be shown through God's Word. And so I want to look at a couple of ways in which we can help ourselves when we study the Bible, when we study God's Word, to improve our knowledge in it. And it starts with preparation. Because it's not just one of those things you sit down, you open the Bible, and you say, okay, I'm going to study now. There is a thought process and an attitude that has to come forth with it. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 15, Paul writes to Timothy and he tells him, be diligent, or King James Version says study. If I'm being diligent, I'm studying. To show yourself or present yourself approved to God, 
a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I am not going to be able to rightly divide the word of truth if I'm not actually spending time in God's word. And it requires that diligence. It requires that mindset that this is more important to me than anything else. Think about all the times that we may spend if we're students in college or in school, all the time we spend on our schoolwork, whether it's at home or at school, in our jobs, the amount of paperwork or whatever it is that we do. Maybe there's times we have to bring that stuff home and work on it at home. Those are important things because school's important, our jobs are important. There are important responsibilities we have in life. But nothing's more important than God and his word. And we should be able and be willing to be diligent to put time into studying his word. Because as Paul says, you have to be able to rightly divide it. You have to be able to cut it straight. That means to determine right from wrong, to be able to apply it properly. In 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 5, Peter says, showing all diligence, had to add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge. And he goes through this list of characteristics. Well, guess what? When he gets to verse 10, he says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Well, it takes study to add to our faith virtue and virtue knowledge and so forth. It takes diligence to do that. Diligence is an attitude. It's a mindset. And that diligence is a key component of preparing not just our workspace or our desk to open up the Bible, but preparing our mind and our heart when we not just read, but study God's word. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 14, Peter says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, talking about the end of time, how that all the, the elements will be burned up, be diligent to be found by him, Jesus, in peace without spot and blameless. It takes diligence to be blameless, to be without spot. Because what that means is that I am capable of understanding right and wrong as God has defined it. And because I'm capable of understanding right and wrong, I am also capable of applying that to making sure I'm doing what's right and I'm avoiding what's wrong. Wisdom is often defined as the application of knowledge. And we can memorize chapters. We can memorize, I don't know of anybody who's ever memorized the whole Bible, but we could if, if, if you had that ability. You could memorize the entire Bible and it wouldn't mean anything if you didn't apply it. Diligence is a key component in that. Also, making sure I have a plan. That's part of diligence, knowing what I want to study, not just kind of flipping the pages and then putting a the finger down and whatever passage it lands on, that's what I'll study today. Whether it's going from Genesis through Revelation, Matthew through Revelation, whatever it is, or maybe it's a topic, maybe it's an epistle, whatever it is, making that effort to say, this is what I'm going to study. And I'm going to take however much time it takes to study through this topic, to study through this book. Because I maybe don't know much about that book or that topic. But planning ahead is a key component. It's part of diligence. Also, help yourself remember what you study. A while back, we went through the book of Acts, and we had a printout of each chapter with a couple of blank lines. And we talked about the fact that with each chapter, 
there's at least two or three main things that you can write for each chapter to help you remember kind of the timeline of the book of Acts. And so you kind of remember Acts 15 is the, the meeting in Jerusalem to talk about the issue of circumcision. You can remember Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. And if you have those key components in your mind, you'll be able to better remember where everything is. Well, this is how we, and, and however it is you learn, maybe it's visual, maybe it's or, uh, uh, through audio, oral, maybe it's whatever it is. But sometimes I've known for me, actually writing it down helps me to remember. Whether it's just a blank notepad and, and a pen, whatever it is, maybe next to Matthew chapter 1, here's the two main things in Matthew chapter 1. The genealogy of Jesus and the birth of Jesus. You go through and it helps us to remember what's in each chapter. And if you are of a mind, use the margins in your Bible. Some of us don't like to mess up our Bibles. And some of us don't have physical Bibles anymore. Some of us have the electronic ones. But for those of you who have the physical Bibles, keep notes. Put cross-references. It helps you to remember. In fact, I still, even though I've gone to an electronic Bible now, I still remember exactly where on the page in my, my main Bible that I had since college, where each, each, like in the book of Acts, where Acts 15 is. I know where on the page it starts. So if I was looking for a specific scripture, I know exactly where to go to look for that scripture, even if I can't remember the exact verse. Because this is where it is. It's in the top right-hand corner. Things like that help us only if we spend time in it. Keep your tools handy. All of us have access to dictionaries. We even have access to Greek and Hebrew dictionaries, which is far more than people have been able to say in centuries past. There's a wonderful resource. I use it Literally, every single sermon I preach, I use it. It's esword.net. It's a wonderful free resource. It's a free Bible download. And it gives you all the strong components, all that. There's nothing you have to pay for or anything like that. But the point is to use the resources we have available. God expects us to use the resources we have to learn more. Now, do I have to have the Greek and Hebrew words to be able to know what a scripture means? No. But it enhances our understanding. It enhances our understanding when I know that there's two main terms for good. One is a beneficial good. One is good because it's implicitly good. It's good because it's of God. One benefits. One is good whether it benefits or not. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and in verse 12, Paul talks about the word that he and the others preached, and how that this word was not from man, but rather from God, how it was given by the Holy Spirit. But notice what he says in verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Notice Paul, it's similar to what he would tell the Romans about those who have a spiritual mind, mind the things that are spiritual. Paul says, with regard to the word of God, the word that they teach, it comes from the Holy Spirit. But notice when he says in verse 13, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. That helps us to appreciate the fact whatever form your Bible comes in whether it's digital or physical 
It is the word of God given to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we should honor that word. Just as much as Americans as we honor the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution of the United States, those documents are held in great esteem. They're revered. Well, how much more so then the Word of God, which comes from the Holy Spirit, pertaining to spiritual things that can only be understood by individuals who have a spiritual mind. Notice in verse 14, Paul says, they're foolishness to people who have a physical mind, a natural man. It doesn't mean anything to them. This is why it's so important for us to honor the word of God. And in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 9, Paul, as he writes to the Colossians, he mentions the facts that he prays for them. But notice what it is he prays for. Verse 9, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Don't underestimate the power of prayer to help you grow. Now, that's not going to do anything if you pray for it, but then don't actually put any effort into actually learning. But don't underestimate when I ask God, help me to learn, help me to grow, help me to be wiser in your word. Notice Paul, he prayed that the Colossians would grow, notice he says, in the knowledge of his will. And in so doing, notice what aspects of his will they were, were, that he was praying about in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And what is that going to do for them? Verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Notice he starts with the knowledge of God. He says in verse 9, that you may be filled with the knowledge of of his will. And then in verse 10, that you will continue to increase in the knowledge of God. Sandwiched in there is wisdom, spiritual understanding, and then the application of it leading to walking worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work. This is why it's so important for us to have the right mind and attitude as it pertains to God's word. It's not a coaster. It's not something to to set on the coffee table all week and then on Sunday, oh yeah, pick it up and take it. It's important for us to honor it and to pray that we will absorb it. And then when it comes to studying God's Word, it is vital that we study God's Word in search for truth Not in search to justify something that I have done or want to do. And we've we've said this before. If you ever find yourself flipping through scriptures, trying to find a proof text, a text that either says it's okay for something that you've done or something that you want to do, there's something wrong. Because that's not how God's word's to be used. Romans chapter 15 and in verse 4, Paul writes to the Romans and says, whatever things were written before were written for our learning. And this is in reference, verses 1 through 3, to prophecy and the things that were written before regarding Jesus. That we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. But the things that were written before for their learning required the ability to take what it said. Not what you wanted it to say, as was often the case with the Jews. When they read Messianic prophecy, what did they read? They read about a warrior king who would lead them against Rome and reestablish the physical kingdom of David because that's what they wanted to have. But when Jesus came, he helped people to understand those prophecies weren't about a physical warrior king. 
but a spiritual one. And he wasn't going to lead you against Rome. He's going to lead you free from sin. In Acts chapter 17 and in verse 11, we're told about the Bereans. The Bereans, these were more fair-minded than the Jews in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily for proof text to, to prove that they were right and Paul was wrong? No, to find out whether the things that Paul said were so. They were searching for the truth. And when it comes down to it, every one of us, we have to study the scriptures not to try to prove how we were raised was right or wrong. It's about searching for the truth and what God says. Letting God's word speak, which requires us to pay attention to the context. Because context is everything. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 16, Paul talks about individuals. These individuals had bad attitudes and bad, bad purposes in their hearts, to be fair. But notice what Peter says. He talks about Paul's epistles and Paul's writings. He says, also in all of his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. They knew just enough to be dangerous, is how we might say that. Now, I, I take that this example of individuals who had bad purposes in their heart. But the point that Peter makes is that it's easy for people to take scripture and twist it to fit what they want it to be. I mentioned before we had a preacher, in fact it was the, I think it was the first preacher our congregation ever had. Uh, he was a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. And in a sermon talking about the value of context, he talked about an example of I can take any scripture I want and make it say something. In fact, he went to an Old Testament passage to make the case that if you weren't a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, you weren't gonna get to go to heaven. And people who are untaught and unstable might would actually believe that if it fit their narrative. But his point was, anybody can take scripture out of context and twist it up and do what they want with it. In the end, we have to let the scripture speak for itself. We have to keep things in its proper context and then make application only after we've established the context. This is the danger of Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. We hear it quoted all the time. Judge not lest ye be judged. And a lot of us get sick of hearing it over and over and over again. Because yes, that's what the scripture says in verse 1. But the context isn't don't judge what's right and wrong. The context is hypocritical judgment making sure we're able to clearly discern right and wrong, and then making proper application. As Jesus taught his disciples in John 12, judge not according to appearance, but according to righteous judgment. Don't just jump at the first uh, uh, sign of whatever it may be. You need to delve into it, get all the facts, get all the information, then take God's word and apply it. Romans 10 is another example. People quote Romans 10 all the time. Call on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. They take that one verse, which Paul himself is actually quoting from the Old Testament, to make it say, all you have to do is call on the Lord. Well, what do they mean, call on the Lord? Well, nobody can agree on what that means. Maybe it's literally calling out to the Lord. Maybe it's a prayer. Maybe it's accepting Jesus into your heart. Never mind the fact that the Bible explains to us what all is involved in calling on the name of the Lord. In fact, Ananias told Paul to be baptized and wash away his sins, and in so doing, call on the name of the Lord. The Bible defines for us 
what calling on the name of the Lord is. But we have example after example of people, sometimes we call it cherry picking. Picking a single verse to make it say what they want it to say. And we have to be careful not to do the same thing. Because the Bible, in its beautiful, wise splendor of harmony, through the Holy Spirit, will be its own commentary. This is why it's so important that we take the whole counsel of God, not just a single verse plucked out of a chapter, out of a letter, without establishing its context. Or establishing what else is written by Paul or by Peter or by James. Because the Bible provides commentary on what everything means. It all meshes together. In fact, most of your Bibles in the back, well, again, in physical, the physical Bibles, you'll have a, a chart called the Harmony of the Gospels. And it kind of goes through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it shows the different events that are recorded by the different authors and how all of these events are, some of them are only recorded in one place, some are recorded in two, some recorded in all four. But how they all mesh and flow together. Well, think about this. In Matthew chapter 22, and in verse 29, we talked about this last week in our Bible class. The Sadducees came to Jesus asking a question about the resurrection, which they didn't believe in anyway. Jesus says, you're mistaken. I love the King James. You do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Verse 31 in the uh, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus himself, in red letters, says that, which helps us to understand that in the Old Testament, every time God makes that statement, after I, uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have died, it's a statement pertaining to the fact that there's going to be a resurrection one day. That's why Jesus used, uses that. Jesus offers the proper understanding. It wasn't just God identifying himself as Yahweh, that the same Yahweh Abraham worshipped and the same Yahweh Isaac and Jacob worshipped. It was establishing that God's going to raise them from the dead. In Matthew chapter 12, we have something similar. And Jesus, he, he does, a, uh, the, the disciples, they're, they're hungry, they're plucking uh, grain, plucking heads of grain to eat, and it's on the Sabbath. The Pharisees get all upset about it in verse 2. Your disciples are doing what is not lawful for them to do on the Sabbath. Jesus' response is, is incredible. It's two-pronged, actually. But what we want to focus on is what the first thing he says in verse 3. Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Now, next, Jesus is going to talk about the priests and how they work on the Sabbath. You're going to tell them that that's wrong. But Jesus' point here with David is, you don't condemn David for doing something wrong on the Sabbath. Why are you condemning me? That's, that's the first part of it. The second part is, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. But the fact of the matter was that David did that which was unlawful. Now, if you go back in the Old Testament scripture, it tells us what happened. It doesn't give us commentary as to whether it was right or wrong. Jesus tells us it was wrong for David to do that. It wasn't right. Just because he was to be king doesn't mean he got to eat the showbread. That was only for the priests. The beauty of this is that we have constant reference to Old Testament scripture in the New Testament. Jesus and the apostles quote Old Testament all the time. And then there are times when we go through the scriptures, through the epistles, that we see how these line up together. And it's important for us to be able not just to focus on our favorite epistle or our favorite book or our favorite topic of study, 
but to study all of it. Otherwise, we lose things in the process. We lose connections that otherwise we would make. What we'll find is that the Bible will not contradict itself. There's a lot of people, spiritually minded people, who get all bogged down over the fact that Paul says that Abraham was justified by faith, whereas James says Abraham was justified by works. And so everybody focuses on Romans, where Paul says, Romans chapter 4, Abraham was justified by faith, as if all I have to do is believe in God and that justifies me. This is a perfect example of understanding the value of context. Because what Paul was dealing with in Romans chapter 4 pertained to the old law and how that the old law needed to be obeyed just as the patriarchal law was in faith. James was making the case regarding Abraham in chapter 2 that faith without works is dead. Obedience must be a part of Otherwise, your faith means nothing. Both go hand in hand. It's not an inconsistency. It's not a contradiction. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 19 that we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. This understanding this coming to a full knowledge and a complete knowledge, knowing this first, verse 20, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private origin or interpretation, verse 21, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. There is a reason why the Scriptures harmonize. There is a reason why everything goes so well together, despite the fact that these books from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament were written over hundreds and hundreds of years. It's beautiful because it came from one source. It came from God through the Holy Spirit. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 16, Paul tells Timothy that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is God-breathed what that term means. God breathed it. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. That is the beauty of the scriptures. And then finally, one last point for you this morning. It's very easy to go to commentaries to, before any study is done, before any searching of our own is done, let's just skip reading the scripture. We'll go to a commentary, we'll read that, and then that'll be just as good as reading the scripture itself. I recommend highly that you do your own study first. Because Time and time again, and it doesn't matter who it is, it doesn't matter who it's written by, every commentary is going to have something in it that you're not going to quite agree with. I have yet to find one that I've agreed with everything that commentator said, whether they were members of the church or not. And it may be something small and insignificant and doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of things, but in the end... This is where studying your scripture yourself comes in. For example, you read the minor prophets. Minor prophets are, uh, those are key historical figures, key uh, aspects of the political situations with Israel and with Judah and Assyria and Babylon, and there's a whole background there. Read the words of the prophets first. That way you know what's being said. Then if you want to consider the historical background, you want to consider the words of commentators or whatnot, that's great, that's fine. But you know what the scripture says. Because what happens is a lot of times it's human nature to take the shortcut. 
take the easy way. And I have known situations where Christians, despite, and that they want to learn, they want to grow, but they don't feel they're smart enough to understand it on their own. And so instead of reading the scriptures themselves or sitting down with someone else and reading it and studying it together, they go to a commentary. And they may not have any idea that this commentator is Calvinist. Or this commentary is written by a Catholic. Or this commentary is written by who knows. And so the bias that it is being written with then gets incorporated into the understanding of the scripture. Instead of having read the scripture themselves and then looking at what commentators say, it becomes part of their understanding. This happens more often than you'd realize. People read these things, and then the meaning that is conveyed in the commentaries becomes their understanding of the Scripture. That's dangerous. Commentaries are great resources. I'm not saying they're not. But be careful of them. Do your own study. Then bring in the external resources to help you kind of flesh out your understanding. But without the foundation of the scriptures, then you're just taking man's word for it. We started out talking about the importance of improving our knowledge in God's word. Whether this is a, uh, uh, again, uh, going from Genesis to Revelation or a topic or an epistle, make it a point. Make it a, a, a focus of yours to grow in the knowledge of God. Maybe it's something we've covered a hundred times in Bible class or in a sermon, but you can never, ever learn too much in God's Word. You can learn too much in man's Word. Much learning has driven you mad, Paul was told, but you can never learn too much in God's Word. That's the lesson for you this morning. Encouragement and some ideas to help us study better, to help us improve ourselves, and to help us fulfill that need to be diligent, seeking to grow in God's Word. Because if we don't grow in God's Word, we're never, ever going to get to a point where we can add to our faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, or temperance, temperance, self-control, so forth. We'll never get to that point. We have to be able to grow in the knowledge of God to understand right from wrong. God's word is available to us. It's far more available to us than in centuries past. To whom much is given, much is expected. We've been given much. Let's make sure we utilize it. We offer an invitation to those who are not Christians to become a Christian this morning, understanding what God's word says. That it's not man's word that says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's Jesus' word. For those of us who are Christians. Making sure we know what God's word says is vital for us to be pleasing to him. And if we don't know, or we don't know what we should know, at this time you ought to be teachers And I have to go over first principles with you again, the Hebrew writer told the Hebrews. The Hebrew writer expected more growth from them. Would he have to say the same about us? Let's make sure that's not the case. If you need help, if you need encouragement in any way, come forward as we stand and sing.